<laughs> Good morning. We're so glad that you were able to join us both in person and online. And I would love for you to stand and sing with us. morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. That's good. That's real good. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, I have a couple things to inform you of. It's a joke first service. I have a couple announcements and I went, oh right, I'm not supposed to say that. That's one of my things, not like someone's like, you can't say announcement. They say don't use announcements. So we have inf information for you here this morning. Um, we just wanted to recognize too that Wednesday is Veterans Day and we're so thankful for all of those who have served in our forces and um, we just want to recognize you guys that we're so appreciative of it um, uh, and uh, to think and be in prayers for veterans and for active military members obviously every day but Wednesday is a day that we recognize them as the as United States um, and then we have uh, a need of a bed we have a church member who has taken in a teenager and um, they, they need a bed for this teenager. So if you have a spare bed or you know of somebody who has a spare bed who can lend it, um, we ask that you would get in contact with Melissa Patridge. Um, if you do not have the information for Melissa Patridge, please contact the office and we will help guide you to where you need to, who you need to get a hold of. Um, and then also I wanted to make an announcement that, I know I'm not supposed to use an announcement word. It just comes out, people. It just does. Uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, November 14th, is the men's breakfast. And uh, men, so if you are free on Saturday at 9 a.m., please come join. They're going through the Ten Commandments. Okay, I think I got everything. Nope. I did not. Yes, we have a second person. There are still boxes over there, people. They need to be taken home, filled with Christmas joy, brought back by Thanksgiving, please, and thank you. Thank you. Yes, I had said this morning, too, I was like, I'm so glad that I actually have somebody who's coming up and talking also, because believe it or not, I hate getting in front of people. I just don't like it. It makes me very uncomfortable. It's less uncomfortable. I've done it enough. But it, I just don't really like the center of attention at all. And yet they asked me to be the announcement guy. But in light of that, as we, get, as we come to our call of worship time, I'm reminded of 1 Kings 8 when King Solomon was dedicating, uh, he had a dedication prayer for the temple that they had built. In verse 27, it said, it says, but Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. The highest heavens cannot contain the magnificent glory of God. And yet, 
He comes to dwell here in this place and with us in this world. He sends His Holy Spirit when you take that step into baptism to dwell with inside you. That is amazing. That is so awesome that He allows that to happen. He is so wonderful. And we need to give Him all the praise and glory that we can. In light of that, I ask that you all rise and that we continue our worship. Father God, we thank you for this time. We give you thanks and praise. Father, we ask that as we continue singing this morning that our voices would lift up to the heaven and bring a smile upon your face. Father, I am thankful that there are those who clean this, this church to make it safe and sanitary for the people in between services. Father, we're so thankful for them with, for that. Lord, I'm thankful for everybody being able to attend the service this morning, Father, and those who are online. We're so thankful that your word is able to reach beyond these, these walls. Father, we do ask that you be here with us. Father, I know that the heavens can't even contain you, much less this building, but Father, we do ask that you can. We put no limits upon your power. Father, I ask that you destroy the things of our hearts that are stopping us from worshiping you. Father, and that we come here to worship you wholeheartedly. Father, I ask that you be with Bill as he delivers your message and myself as I deliver meditations, that you would speak through us and that whenever we're done speaking your word, that we can say, wow, what an awesome God we serve. I thank you for all the many blessings you've given us, but especially for sending your son for that third day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will.
So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I tell you, I love that song. It reminds me of Matthew Verse 6, well, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I have to confess to you, I've stored up things here on this earth. I've set my heart on things, meaningless things here on this earth. And if you were to ask me whenever, a year or so ago, I would have lied to you and told you I did not. But if you would deeply ask me and I was asking myself, I would tell you that I'd have stored up things. I'd treasure things here on this earth. I'm thankful that the things that my heart so once desired have started to fade away and the things that God has in store are becoming so much more brilliant and I probably would have told you that it's crazy to think that I'm more joyful now than I was then I probably would have laughed at you but just as that song says that when you turn your heart upon Jesus the things of this earth will grow strangely dim it does. The things of this earth have slowly gone more and more dim. Now I have a long way to go. I'm not perfect by any means. But the things that I treasure more now than what I have in the past is to help build up God's kingdom. And I tell you, there's such freedom in that. Freedom. And it can be scary. It really can. Because we enjoy our things on this earth. We really do. But there's things that are of eternal worth that glorify our God in heaven who gave us life. So I invite you to walk with me through this as we slowly fade away from the things of this earth and put our hearts and minds on things that are set beyond this earth. Let's pray. Father, you are the giver and taker of all good things. Lord, I pray now that you destroy the things that are on my heart that don't glorify your name. Lord, that you set our mind, our strength on you. Father, as we take this time here to give back a small portion of what you already have given us, the abilities that we have to be able to go out to work. Father, that we glorify your name at this time, that we worship you. Father, and we store up things that are in heaven. And the things of this earth, they slowly fade away. Father, I ask you to take the fears of that away from me, to break that stronghold that I have that seem like semen at times, that you just destroy it, that your word takes true to my heart, and that I can trust you more and more each and every day. Father, I thank you for the faithful people here at Creve Core that they give to you faithfully, that they give to you wholeheartedly, and that you help aid them in the freeness that I have felt. I thank you, God, for the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus most of all. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
before I open the scriptures for our message today, two pieces of uh, housekeeping. As Brody graciously pointed out last week, we're now in November and pastor appreciation has passed, so we can dispense with that. Thanks, Brody. As you all know, this is not an easy season in which we find ourselves, but your kind words and your gifts, your encouragement makes it better. And Gretchen and I want to simply say thank you. But we also believe in what the Bible calls the priesthood of all believers. So if you are a Christian, you are a minister. And therefore, Gretchen and I want to tell you, we appreciate you and your faithful service to our King. And may we continue to do so until we have drawn our last breath. Second item is a reminder, as I did last week, that we as a people of God have a singular purpose. Two words which I ask you to memorize, to embrace, and to pursue. Make disciples. We are here to draw people to Jesus. We are here to help people grow up in Jesus. With that said, would you pray with me and we'll open the word. Father, we bow before you this morning and uh, we have sought to lift our voices in praise. We have sought to glorify your name. And our prayer, Father, is that you are pleased. And may we praise you always with every breath that we draw. Father, as we turn to your word now, we do pray that our ears will be attentive to what your Holy Spirit has to teach us through the pages of Scripture. So make us attentive, make us pliable. And Father, may we not just hear, but may we do. In Christ we pray. Amen. I have a question I want to begin with today. It is simply this. Are Christians distinguishable from any other group of people? Are our thoughts, our words, our behavior any different from those that we share this planet with who don't know Jesus? If you were simply to take those of us gathered this morning and plop us down in the midst of the general population of Tazewell County with people who are members of a different kind of religion like Buddhism or Islam, or if you were to put us out there with people who are part of service organizations like the Rotary or the Kiwanis, if you just put us down in your neighborhood, would people know that we are Christians? We should be identifiable because we are called by Christ to be radically different from this world. Yet the question, question remains, are we? I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians, from the book of Romans, and from 1 Peter this morning. If you follow along in your Bibles, we'll begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with simply this idea, what I've titled my sermon, You Are Not What You Once Were. The New Testament has a number of what I call sin lists. The Apostle Paul's a master at this, though John does it as well. Just talks about the behaviors that characterize the people of the world, which includes you and I before Jesus entered into our lives. He does one of those lists here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's quite a list. And if you were to read through the other list and you were honest with yourself, you would see your life in there apart from Jesus. Let's be honest. Let's agree with Scripture. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that includes me. And that includes you. The church in Corinth, they kind of found themselves between the proverbial rock and a hard place. We don't know how many people were a part of this church. But we do know that they lived in the midst of one of the most immoral cities of the ancient Roman Empire. 
The temple of Aphrodite was situated upon a hill just outside the city limits of Corinth. And every evening at dusk, 1,000 temple priestesses, read prostitutes, descended from the temple into the city to lead in worship of Aphrodite. The church struggled. How do you live as the light of the gospel in the midst of such worldly darkness? And yet, is it so much different from our day and age? Is our society so civilized and so moral that the church does not have to struggle with being the light in the darkness? You know better. It's not a whole lot different 2,000 years later. And the people who comprised the church in Corinth were people who had come out of that background. And interestingly enough, again, let's be honest, we who comprise the church in Creve Core are people who come out of a worldly background. And so we have to look also at verse 11. You may have noticed I, I skipped a verse. I stopped just short. Verse 11, Paul says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. He draws a beautiful contrast. He tells us, you are not what you once were. Hallelujah, folks. And we need to learn how to live in the joy of a new identity in Christ. And we need to learn how to live that identity in Christ practically. Yet what I often find is too many Christians, they can't get their minds out of what they used to be. And some even struggle with getting their living out of what they used to be. But notice, it's past tense and present tense. Such were some of you. This is past. This is not your identity now. And then three phrases all begin with the little word but. And Paul makes a powerful point. He says, but you were washed. You were washed. You were made pure. The stain of sin removed. It's like Paul in Acts chapter 22 verse 16 where Ananias tells him, What are you waiting for, Paul? Get up and be baptized, washing away your sins. There is a cleansing that takes place. It does not matter where you have been. It does not matter what you have done. In Christ, it is washed away. Jesus, the great Redeemer. And Paul adds to that, you were sanctified. It, it means you were made holy. And oftentimes we think of holiness in the sense of behavior. I'm obedient. And yes, that's a part of it. But the idea actually means that you have been set apart. You have been dedicated to service and loyalty to God. You may have once been worshipers of Aphrodite, but now you are worshipers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are worshipers of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a change has been wrought in my life. I apologize for using the same illustrations over and over again. I only have three stories to tell. Poor Gretchen has listened to the same ones for 40 years. My brother was a Vietnam veteran, and when he was serving in Southeast Asia, he, you just heard this, yeah, sorry Pam. Thank you, Pam. You're an encourager. While he was in Southeast Asia, he purchased a set of china, very nice china, and had it shipped home to my mother. 
Interestingly enough, it all arrived unscathed, not a chip, not a broken plate, nothing. And mom cherished those and kept them in the china cabinet where we never saw them. <laughs> Except when my brother was home and then they would come out and we would have this nice feast with this fine china, which just proves the point that he always was her favorite because they got used when he was home, not with me. That china served special purpose because it meant something special to mom having come from her son in Vietnam. We have been set apart like fine china. Not to sit uselessly in a cabinet, but for special purpose devoted to the service of God and loyalty to Him. We're not what we used to be. And then he adds a third. He says, and you were justified. That word justified is drawn from the legal system. It's a court word. It has to do with being acquitted, being declared not guilty, having your guilt removed. How odd, since I know I am guilty. Since I know that I have sinned and fallen short of His glory, and yet in Christ I am justified. For the justice of God is met in Jesus at the cross. It does not matter where you have been or what you have done. In Christ you are not what you once were. Let the burden and the shame and the guilt wash away. Now live the new identity that He gives you. Step into a new life, which you may rightly say, okay, Bill, how do I do that? To which I would say, well, wonderful. I'm glad you ask. Perfect segue to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Rhonda read, for it, read it for us earlier in the service. I'm going to reread it. And it is the key verse, if you follow along in Core 52, the book by Mark Moore, that he focuses on in this week's reading. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There is a transformation to be wrought. There is a change to be brought about. What I was is left behind and what I am to be is being brought about. 2 Corinthians 3.18 will say we are being transformed. The Holy Spirit Himself is working upon each follower of Jesus to bring about a restoration of the fullness of the image of Jesus in us. That's something I look forward to. Transformed, not conformed. Notice what he say. It, spiritual transformation requires a nonconformity to the world. Do not allow the world to shape your thoughts, your worldview, your behavior. Paul will say in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles.